Praise the Lord, everybody. And we're glad to have you here, Great Commission Pentecostal Church. It is Wednesday evening, and uh, it's hump day, as they say. We're halfway through the week, and I'm sure for some of you this week has been a trying, maybe stressful week. Maybe somebody has a victory. Somebody, maybe somebody has a praise report today. God's good all the time. Even when we're going through the mundane things of life or the spectacular things, or even the sad things of life, God is always good. And we always should have a praise in our mouth. Praise God. David says, I want to have the high praises of God in my mouth. Praise God. There's something good. There's something beneficial to your life. When you learn to praise God, when you learn to praise God, it doesn't matter the circumstances, it doesn't matter if they're good or bad, but we learn that we are to praise God, and this is, this is, the, this is the essence of our existence, learning to praise and magnify God. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding, and certainly uh, we know that to be true. There's nothing like living for God. There's no other life. There's no other peace that you get with all of the tribulations of life. And everybody has a different road that you're leading. Everybody has a different life. You have a different set of circumstances that you deal with. Things that cause you uh, conflict and uh, things that you have to work through. But when our lives are dedicated to the Lord, there's something that's different about them. There's something that it's that peace, as the Bible says. As Jesus said, that he gives that passes all understanding. Um, sometimes in life we're going to be down, we're going to be up, we're going to be happy, we're going to be sad. But abiding within us throughout, throughout all of those uh, changes should be the peace of God. Because when everything comes down to, you know, its resolution, we should resolve within ourselves that I trust God and if it's good, it's because of Him. If it's going bad right now, God will get me through it. And for Him I live, for Him I die. And that's our motivation in life. It brings things in perspective. It helps us to see things as they really are. Praise God. Well, we're glad to have you with us tonight. And of course, this is a remote service. And so I'm going to get into the teaching of God's Word here in a minute. But I want to pray. I know there's a prayer request. There's some things that we have uh, some prayer requests that have come through our group me this week. And so I want to pray for some of these prayer re requests that we have. Some other things. So if I miss something, um, if you text um, or send a note here, we'll get that. And maybe at the end of the uh, broadcast, we can um, pray for those things as well. But praise God, because I believe that God wants to heal. God wants to touch. God wants to show himself mighty. God's looking for faith. He's always looking for faith. Praise God. So we want to add to our faith. We want to increase our faith. Because the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible. It's one of the, the few things that the Word of God um, will go to that negative length to, to let us know. But it's really to communicate something that's vital, that's crucial to our salvation, crucial to our living for God, crucial for God even being retained in our thinking. And that's having faith. Believing Him. There's a lot of people that have become disappointed, frustrated in life for one reason or another, and then they aim that towards God, or maybe they just walk away from God. But we, have, we don't want to be of any of the people in that category. We want to take it to God in prayer. We want to believe God. We want to trust God. And we want to watch God move. We want to watch God act. He's willing. He's waiting. He's ready. He's able. So we're going to go to God in prayer as we're opening this service up today. We're going to pray the prayer of faith, believing that God is going to touch and change situations. You know, God's working. Regardless of what you see or don't see or don't know or don't understand, God is working. Praise God. And when you believe that in faith, you can go to God within faith, believing Him and praying as if He's actually working because He is. Father, we love You tonight. We're so thankful for your goodness and mercy. We're thankful, God, for who you are and all that you represent in our lives, every promise that you've made, everything that your word says, God, that we stand on. God, the default by which we rest, Lord, or we settle down to, Lord, is your word. And it's full of many promises. It's full of the things that you will do. 
Regardless of the circumstances, God, that we face, God, there's so many examples in your word that you've healed bodies. And tonight, Lord, there's those that need healing, God. Lord, I'm thinking of the one, God, with emphysema, Lord God. Pray that you would touch, Lord God, and have your way in his body, Lord God, in, in I guess it's COPD, Lord, in Doug's body. I pray in Jesus' name for your touch in his body tonight. God, I pray, Lord, for your help, Lord, in that family, Lord God. I pray that you would have your way, Lord. Touch, Lord God. I pray, Lord, for your goodness, Lord, and your mercy to be shown, Lord, in every circumstance. You know, those that are going through financial difficulty tonight, I pray that you would move in their lives. God, those that are having marital problems, Lord, God, move in their lives. Relationship problems, Lord. Family issues, Lord. I pray tonight that you would touch, Lord, those that are drug addicted. Those that, Lord, are fighting a battle, Lord, that's bigger than them. God, I pray tonight, Lord, for your touch and for your strength that's made perfect in our weakness, God. Show up, Lord, in somebody's life, God. Show your strength. Show your might. Show, Lord God, your mercy, Lord God, that endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Touch tonight. Bless, Lord. Let us hear your testimonies as a result of this prayer, God. And the other prayers that are going forth, Lord, on behalf of those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Well, praise God. We've been, um, we've, we've been out for the last two Wednesdays. And um, let's just remember our building and those things that we're looking to uh, get, get uh, some resolution with. God's good. God's good. And we're just seeking God and let's just continue to pray that God would lead us. Because God is always doing something. Whether you see it or not, God is setting up your future. God is setting up your tomorrow. Your today has been the result. The blessings that you enjoy today have been a result of things that God has put in place yesterday. Building blocks that God... God is a God of foundation. He builds a foundation. And many times we're looking for what's above the surface, but seeds go into the ground and much of their work, all that work that allows for anything to penetrate above the ground happens beneath the ground where nobody can see it. And so by faith, praise God, we look at the things of God. We allow God to move and work in our lives unseen. But that's the beauty of it all. That's where faith comes in. Faith says, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust God even though I don't see it and even though I don't feel that He's working. I believe. Praise God. It's, it's not predicated upon the evidences that I can tangibly acquire or acknowledge. But it's based upon my belief, my confidence in Him. And that's where you have to be. If I have confidence in Him, everything around me can be fallen down. But my confidence and my trust is in Him. Praise God. Praise God. And that's a beautiful thing to, to, to have. That's a beautiful place to be. Praise God. So tonight, I, I want to go to the Word of God. And it uh, won't be before you very long. I, I want to just share some things out of the Word of God that I think should help us. And really, a lot has to do with how we think. How you think, the, uh, the thoughts that are, are leading, they are, they are taking you somewhere. Um, how those thoughts are put together, um, it's important. You know, we can give this to God. We can allow God to help us to make up our minds, to help us to find our direction. We can do that. The Word of God, uh, it, it's very plain. It lets us know that God can work on the inside of you. The Bible says He can change a man's heart. These are things that are impossible for you and I. We find it very difficult to try to change somebody, but God says He can. Yeah, He says it, you know, in Proverbs 1 or 21 and 1, it says, The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water, whithersoever He chooses, He turns it. Praise God. God turns. He can turn. He can change a heart. That's how powerful our God is. 
And not just one little heart or some little heart, but the heart of the king, the, the guy that's in charge. The guy that's in charge of everything. God says, it's that guy. I can change his heart. And you see, that gives us confidence. Because one of the hardest things that we find to do in life is to change the mind of people that have power. But God says, I have more power. And I can change their mind. I can change their hearts. So praise God. God is an awesome God. I'm going to turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Give you a minute to get that. But we want to um, come out of that scripture tonight. I'm going to go through several scriptures. But I hope to, um, to leave something, deposit something into your spirit. The Word of God has that ability to say things to us that nothing else really can. Like nothing else really can. You know, we serve an awesome God. His Word is, uh, is weighty. And it has the ability to affect us today. And it's still good enough to affect us tomorrow. It's a truth that, that is beyond uh, any amount of time. You know, it's not just static or just pertinent to one uh, area, one period of time. But the Word of God has truths that, are, that, that go with every generation. And tonight we want to talk about some of that. The Bible says in Proverbs 16 and 1, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Our ability to contemplate, to reason, to evaluate, to assess, to analyze, and all of this, all of these uh, higher reasoning uh, capability that comes from God but in that I can get some information I can assess it I can analyze it I can I can break it down I can I can then come to a conclusion and I can be 100% wrong I can be 100% wrong and people often are I mean everybody's not right uh, there are many different opinions on just about every subject in life. I mean, to be human is to almost disagree, to have a different take, because you have your own mind, your own computer, as it were, that contemplates, that, uh, that takes the information in like the next guy and reasons with it and comes to a conclusion. But the wise man here is telling us that this is of the Lord. The preparation of the heart in man and the answer from the tongue, of, of the tongue rather, is from the Lord. God's given us the ability and God can work within that ability. What does God say about the heart? God gets into the intricate details. Things that we don't really contemplate all the time or, or maybe never even think about. The sourcing of it all or the very nitty gritty I mean, the baser elements of how we function. God gets into that. And he says, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. In Jeremiah 17 and 9, this revelation, this information is conveyed to us by God through the mouth of the prophet uh, Jeremiah. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all. I mean, the first thing you say about the heart, what God says about the heart, the first layer of assessment, or the base, um, the, the basis from which it works or that it does anything, is deception. Praise God. But I need to allow God to, to have this heart of mine. Because left to my own devices, now, the preparation of the heart in man... That's the, what brings me to my thoughts, or what brings me to my actions, rather. And, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. I need to yield to God, and God can control how I think. God can control, but I have to, yield, I have to give that to Him. God's given that ability, and it's different from, think about this, it's different from animals, we, we're, we think different, we, uh, on a higher plane, more contemplative, uh, much more planning, much more things that, that an animal never, never even crosses their mind. But this is how God has made us. 
But we can take that and we can think, well, I can make up my own mind. I can do my own thing. And many, many, many people in our world do. But when you do, you come to the place that you have to reckon with the next verse here. It says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits. The Lord weighs the spirits. What does that mean? Well, you think about a weight. You think about a weight. And so what does that weight do? It, in, in one very general sense, it judges. It makes a distinction between two. Maybe one has a higher um, uh, weight to it. I mean, it's heavier than the other, and that scale is going to show that. So a judgment. That weight is, a, is referencing a judgment. So God says, I judge the spirit. I judge the motives. That's what God says. God is, his, his expertise is judging why you do what you do. Sometimes the action in and of itself, we can look at an action in and of itself and assess a value or a judgment to it, and it can be completely wrong. Case in point, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says about love, he says, if I give my body to be burned and I have not love, it profits me nothing. I'm a, I'm, I, it's, it's, no, it, it's done nothing. It has no impact. It's not impressing God. So just the actions in and of themselves do not impress God. God is interested <clears throat> in what the reasoning, the reasoning, or the, the reason, or the motivation behind the action. Praise God. He doesn't just take the action and just assume things. He knows. He says, the heart, in Jeremiah 17, going back to that, that statement that he makes, very poignant about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So a rhetorical question ends that little statement about the heart, that little revelation about the heart. In the very next verse, he then says, I, the Lord... Try the reins of the heart. So now you have God giving us this imagery of like a horse with a bit in his mouth. And so the reins are being pulled. And when you pull it one way, because it's attached, you know, there in, in that very sensitive place, it makes his head turn, his whole body turns. He's sensitive to that. And God says, I do the same thing. And I give to everyone according to his works. I know the motivation behind what you do and I reward you accordingly. This is what God says. He's the only one that can see that. We can fool everybody. It's easy to do that. We can fool everybody. But God knows the heart. It says here, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. <laughs> and this is true. People can justify anything they do. You get a madman as some of the rulers of different nations have been, and they will justify it. Crazy, illogical as it may be, but to them, they have a rational reason as to why they're doing what they do. And this is what he's saying with the heart. People, we're all like that in, in some way when we're unchecked by the Spirit of God. Because you can think you're right. You can think that you can put all the evidences together and other people might see and what you're doing and what you're saying and they may see how wrong it is. But because you've been deceived, the heart, remember, is deceptive. And so that even means the party to whom that heart belongs. This self-deception is one of the worst kinds of deception because you don't even know you're being deceived. And yet still, you have put all your eggs in one particular basket that is false. And so... He says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but God weighs the Spirit. And if God is weighing the Spirit, I need to have my life surrendered to God. So when he weighs my actions, then he can talk to me, and I can respond to him. I can change. If I'm going down the wrong path, I think I'm going right. I've, I've contemplated, I've, I've looked at everything, I've assessed the situation, and I've started down a path. If God cannot... Uh, speak to me. There's no way to interdict 
my direction and change it. But when I'm surrendered to God and I'm committing my ways to Him, the Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. But in all of your ways, acknowledge Him. If I'm acknowledging Him in everything I do, you know, sometimes the way God answers you isn't an audible voice. Rarely is it an audible voice. I don't know about you, but I don't get audible voices. But God, through circumstances, many times, lets me know. As I'm looking at it, God will reveal this set of circumstances is pushing in this direction. It's giving me this kind of indication. And sometimes He does it in other ways, but, but God can influence. I want God to be able to weigh my spirit, but I want God to be able to check me, right? I want God to be able to check me, and I want to have a responsiveness to the voice of God. I don't want to be in a place where I think I know it all and God can't even talk to me because I think that I'm doing God's will. That's a dangerous thing. Deception. It's the thing about it. The, the, the heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not a man. You can deceive everybody. You can deceive yourself. I need to, I need to give my thoughts. I need to give my ways. I need to allow God to speak at all times when I'm endeavoring to do it, to live my life as I'm living it. I need to be open to the voice of God. I need to be open to God correcting me. We need the correction of God. None of us are perfect. And so we need God to be able to correct us, but we have to be in a place. Our spirit has to be in a place. You know, Jesus says one, one time to his disciples, um, they wanted to call down fire from heaven. John and John and James, sons of uh, thunder, they wanted to call down fire from heaven, but God says, you know, Jesus looked at them and says, watch your spirit. Your spirit. It's very important that what's going on in your spirit is right. Your heart is right. Your motives are right. Sometimes we have to check ourselves. We may feel justified in being upset and and to, to lash out in vengeance, but God says, check yourself, because that belongs to me. You may, be, you may feel justified, but it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Him. And so, at square one, you're, you're corrected. You're, you're wrong. Vengeance belongs to God. So when I lift my hands to, in vengeance or revenge, or it, I do something, or I, I act in vengeance, God says, wait a second, that belongs to me. He says in verse number 3, Commit thy works, your actions, to the Lord, and your plans will be established. If I want my plans to be, if I want God to bless what I'm doing, I have to commit it to Him. That means it needs to be run under His microscope. And so if, it, if it's found to be something He's not pleased with, if I push on beyond that, Hey, I'm not going to get his blessings. And my, and my plans will not be established. God's not going to bless and lead me and, and do those things because I'm working against God. And I'm surprised that some people where they, the word of God is very clear, and yet still they want to do their own thing and think they're going to commend the blessing of God. It's not going to happen. You deceive yourself. You know, there's, you know, people that do a lot of different things that they think, because they, because maybe society gives a consensus. Look at the abortion issue. Because society gives a consensus to that. And so because it does, I can do it. Even though the word of God is against it. And then I can still say God's going to bless me or think God's going to be happy with what I'm doing. No. God doesn't compromise his word. He doesn't change. He doesn't flip over. He doesn't say it one day and now all of a sudden these truths things that he considers that he hates, he all of a sudden likes, or is now going to tolerate? No, that's man. Man can be against something, it can be illegal one day, and then it gets watered down over time as people compromise their positions and their morals and their standings, and all of a sudden, where they were looking outside into Sodom, now like Lot, they pitched their tent that way, and they find themselves in that place. It's deception. It's deception. 
But the Bible says that we are to commit our works to the Lord, our actions, everything I do, acknowledging Him in all my ways. I've got to do it. And He's going to establish my plans. God wants to establish. You, you want your plans to be established by God. Praise God. Because God's going to give you that approval. I, I, I want the approval of God. I, I don't just want to do things on my own. But I want God's approval. I want God's roadmap. Praise God. Luke 6.45 says, As a good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance, for of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So back to this very first verse where we, we said here, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. But it's only when we yield ourselves to God, when we allow God to work on the inside, because what's there is going to affect what comes out of here. What's in your head or in your heart is going to affect what comes out of your mouth. He says this, a good man of the treasures, good treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. But an evil man out of the evil treasures, what are you, what are you, um, what are you storing in your heart? What kind of treasures? What's valuable to you? What kind of principles are valuable to you? What kind of things do you, do you hold on to? What kind of uh, beliefs do you hold on to? What kind of values do you hold on to? You see, some people, they will value things that the world pats them on the back and says, this is the way you should feel. This is the way you should think. And when those things are stored in your heart, when it comes time to act upon those things or something that's in that vein or in that category of thinking or actions, the actions that they take are going to be based on what they've treasured, what they've stored in their heart, what they valued, what opinions they valued. That's why the Bible says in Psalms 1, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel, the advice, the way of thinking, the values, the moral thinking of God, the rebellious thinking to the word of God that the world espouses, because that's what's really going on. The world is in rebellion to God. And that's why the, the rules in the word of God, people don't like. They took the, the Ten Commandments out of school. The Ten Commandments are a good idea. They are a great idea. They're also a commandment of God. But when you start rebelling against God, even good ideas... Even common sense doesn't make sense to you. And this is what's happening in our world. But the preparation of the heart, you know, it's because, you know, I have treasured some things. I have taken, I've, take, I've, put the, I've placed a value on some things. And so I've put those things. I've bought into some things. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Now that may seem such a simple phrase and simple turn on the phrase. But listen, it's in, important that when you know truth, you grab a hold of it and you stand on it. Because for the rest of your life, for the rest of your life, Satan is going to wage a war of attrition against that truth that's in your heart. He's going to try to get you to come down off the wall, building that wall, Nehemiah. He's going to try to get you off the wall, try to get you away from the work that you're doing. But you have to recognize what he's up to. And you, but the first thing is the preparation of the heart. You've got to grab truth and you've got to put it down in your heart. Uncompromisable, this is what I'm standing, this is what I believe. Because when you make things soupy and compromisable, Satan's going to always pull you in another direction. You'll think one thing today and in a few months or years down the road, you'll find yourself in another place. Because you didn't treasure truth. It was taken away from you. The Bible says that when the seed of the word of God is sown, when it's not understood, the birds that came and ate it, it's like the devil come and take that seed away. The devil wants to take the word of God out of your heart. The devil wants to fight. He wants to take the word of God out of your mind. 
But we have to see its value and we have to store it in our hearts and allow God to use that to affect all of our actions. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Those contemplations, those preparations of the heart, God, if we allow, if we open ourselves up, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. If, if I'm doing this, if I'm trusting God with all of my heart and I'm not leaning to my own understanding, what's my understanding? Well, it's the way I see it. It's the way I'm, I'm, I'm analyzing, I'm assessing. Um, it, it's, it's, it's how I'm taking the data that I, my mind has brought in, my senses have brought in, and what I'm making of that, that data, how I'm assessing it. What's my conclusion? And that is important. So he says, so a man thinks in his heart, if this is the way you think it is, that's the way it is. That's where you're going to be. And then he says, eat and drink, and uh, saith he to, to thee, but his heart is not with you. As, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. He's that way. I don't want to be deceptive. You know, we, we talked about this at the very beginning. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So many times what a person has, what they're feeling in their heart and what their mouth says can be two different things. It's the epitome of, of, of deception. Because their heart's not with you, but they can say that they can say it one way, but at the same time, that's not where they're truly at. And this is what God says when He's talking about the heart. He says, The heart of man is so deceitful. You don't know uh, you, someone can 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 pull the wool over your eyes so easily because you don't know where they're truly at. I want to be a person like the Bible talks about Nathaniel. When Jesus saw Nathaniel, he says to him, here comes a man in whom there is no guile. What does that mean? Well, God, you know, he was saying, Jesus was saying that this man has no double motives, ulterior motives. You, he's not saying one thing. Deception's not in him is what he was saying. It was a high, high compliment to pay someone. Jesus looked right through him. Jesus told him, he says, I saw you while you were sitting under the tree yesterday. But also I see the heart of you. And within your heart, there's not these competing motives where you're saying one thing and you're feeling another. And people on the outside are none the wiser to it. I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to make sure that, that I am transparent I don't want to have these competing uh, things going on in my heart and in my mind. I don't want to be a, a person that's deceptive. Because that's how Satan is. And if you're not careful, you'll be just like him. Jesus talks to some people. He says, you're just like your father, the devil. He's a liar from the beginning, and he's full of lies, and you're doing the same thing. And I don't want to be that way. The Bible says that the last days is going to be earmarked by deception. By deception. And today in our world, we see that. that lying is a, it's the, it's, the, it's the capital by which people operate. It's how people transact through lies. I don't want to be that way. I don't want to live a, a life that's full of lies. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be a person where... Everything I say is a lie. And everything I live is a lie. And everything I show is a lie. I don't want to live that way. I want, there has to be a desire. And when we get close to God, it's a desire to be transparent. God doesn't want us to be so full of deception. Because people can start to feel the insincerity. God wants us to be like Him. And the more we get closer to Him, we start to have the heart that God has. You know, something that's amazing about the heart of God is that His mercy, the Bible says, endures forever. The thing that perhaps separates God from everybody else is that mercy stuff. 
That mercy stuff is like nothing else because nobody else has it, has mercy like that. Nobody has it like that. Nobody shows it like that. He's not like men. We have a tolerance level and, you know, we're, we'll cut you off. But God says his mercy endures forever. As long as there is a heart in you that's hungry to know God. As long as there's a heart within you that wants to turn back to God. No matter how difficult it is. You know, for the prodigal son, it was quite difficult to come back to his father. But as long as that desire was there, through all the difficulty, you know, all the feelings of I'm nobody, because he certainly was depressed. He certainly had very low self-esteem at this point because he said, I can't even be called a son because I'm, I'm, I've done things that are unworthy of sonship. And so now I'm lower than a son. And so I'm going to go back to my father and, and surely he'll hire me. I, I can just be a hired hand. And there was this humility. And you know, there's something about life when you've lived life and when you've thought you were right and you did your own thing and found out you weren't, bumped your head, messed up some things, and you come back with a certain humility, a brokenness. You know, the Bible says that God will not refuse a broken and a contrite heart. When somebody recognizes that acknowledgement factor is so important to God, He says, even after you're saved, after you've had your sins washed away in the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus, and you've made mistakes then, He says, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and then to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, the stigma, the penalty, and all the things that go along with that sin. He wipes it all out. This is what he was willing to do. But he says when you do this, when you acknowledge it, when you confess it, when you're sorry, God says, I don't know why he's cast you out. And that is a, that's a God-unique characteristic that he wants to form in each one of us. I need the mercy of God. You know why? Because he says, he says, you know, just that goes back to the old principle. You know, God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, what he's going to reap. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You need to get some. You need to store some up. Because you never know when you're going to need it. Praise God. I want to be a person that acts as God acts. When Jesus was here, and as God has worked throughout the eons of time, the mercy that he's shown to mankind, it's a, an incredible thing. He says in Psalms 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Then he says about your ways, we talked about this earlier, commit thy way unto the Lord. Your actions, the bent of your life, your will, what your desires are. He says, commit your way. This is everything that, that encompasses my life, how I think, what my goal, what my underlying uh, desires are, and what I'm all about as a person. Com that, that's your way. He says, commit thy way unto the Lord. God, I want you to direct what I do. I want you to influence how I think. I want you, your word to influence my actions that I take, the morals that I have, the ethics that I have. I want your word to influence that. I don't want to just use my own noodle and decide, assess, and to conclude that I'm right. I want your word to dictate that. That's why David, you know, David says in Psalms 119, if you read that chapter, he goes through that chapter talking about the rules, the laws, the statures, you know, of God, the statures of God, all those things that, that God, uh, that, that concern God's way. He talks about how he loves it, how he's committed to it, because it's only when you have that kind of attitude about the things of God 
that God's, God will actually influence the way you act. You'll be thinking about this. It will control you. Praise God. I want to be spirit controlled. I want the spirit to control me. But if, in order for the spirit to control me, I have to have, I need to learn the word too. Because the, the spirit is that emotional connection. Praise God to everything. But I don't just want to be, I don't, I don't just want to have the emotional connection without the word giving me direction. Because there's a lot of people that get caught up in, in the spirit and they don't have word. And what happens is the enemy of their soul can influence them right away from the Word of God. You need spirit and Word. Both. Both are necessary. I don't just want to have the Word and reject the Spirit of God. Because now I'm not going to understand the Word. I'm going to misinterpret the Word. I'm going to do a lot of things with the Word that, that aren't, you know, that's going to be man's interpretation of it. Because it's not in your thinking. You know, Jesus looked at Peter one day and said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Your brain, your thinking, nor the thinking of another person that might have told it to you. No, none of that. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father, which is in heaven, I've got to have the Spirit, praise God, to, to influence how I see the Word and to influence how I see life, to influence the direction that I take, the actions that I take, the words that I speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want to speak things that are that are true. If my heart's full of deception, you don't really know what my words really mean. Because I'm going to speak words, and if I'm full of deception, I'm going to say whatever it takes to get what I want. And this is what people do so often. They say what's going to get them what they want. I don't want to be duplicitous. I do not want to have a heart that has competing motives like that. I want Jesus to look at me like he's looked at Nathaniel and say, here's a man where there's no guile. What you see is what you get. That was a high compliment. Praise God. And God wants to pay that compliment to us. God wants that to be a part of our lives. That needs to be a part of our lives. But it comes when, when you understand that, and just kind of wrapping this up, he says, the preparation of the heart and the answer of our tongue. It's the Lord's. It's from the Lord. But at the same time, that's only when we've committed our works to the Lord. Because if it's just your thinking, if it's just my thinking, it's just my assessment, or it's just my analyzation of, whatever um, material or data or circumstances in the world that I live in that I'm thinking about and using to make a decision or come to a conclusion, if it's just me, the Bible says all the ways of a man are clean. They're good. They're righteous. They're right. The right thing to do and, you know, all these things in my own eyes. But if I ever want to get past self-righteousness. I have to get his righteousness. His thinking, what his word says, has got to become a part of me. And it helps me to think right. You see, because you can excuse a lot of things. You can excuse a lot of your actions. The Bible talks about, in the book of the Judges, it says that Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. What an incredibly horrible way to live. Everybody doing what they think is right in their own eyes. There's no rules that we're going by. There's no set, you know, no, I'm just doing what I think is right because I think it's right or I have my reason. Everybody has an argument. And if there's no central rule, if there's no central authority, from which we um, our, our thinking emanates what's right and what's wrong, our morals, our ethics, and all. If there's no central uh, objective um, way that we, we base everything on, something that's tried and true that we all give heed to, you have a mess. And that's what they had. And so 
God always established a leader, but the leader came in and the leader always was directing them back to God's thinking. He says, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. If I want God to prepare my heart, if I want God to answer with my tongue, if I want God to give me the words to say, you know, there are many different circumstances that we go into in life. And there's people that we meet for different reasons, under different cir um, circumstances. And, but I want God to give me the words to say. I want God to prepare my heart, prepare my thinking, to line it up so that when I'm in the presence of that person and something comes up, God gives me the words to say. How would you like that when you meet somebody that God is speaking through you to them because He knows their needs? God wants to work like that. You know, it's part of the gifts of the Spirit. The Bible talks about, you know, uh, Paul talks about, you know, uh, being in a service and, and a sinner comes in and you, God uses you to tell that person all about their life. But that's how Jesus did with the woman at the well. And she was so impressed by it, so shocked by it, knew that it was, it was, it was divine and that he was somebody, you know, she didn't really know who Jesus was, but she knew that he was definitely of God. And people need to, they need to know that. I want God to speak through my mouth. I want God to give me the words to say. I don't just want to have casual conversations with people and, and just meet people and, you know, I, you know, that's a once and done thing. I want to sow a seed. The Bible says one sows and another waters. But it's God that gives the increase. But I want to be a part of that process in somebody's life. And you, tonight, need to be a part of that process in somebody's life. But it takes... I don't ever want to get to the place that I think that I'm saved and, and I, there's no improvement needed. There's improvement needed in every one of us. I don't want to get relaxed and deceived. You can get relaxed and deceived and think you have it all together. And you're doing what, you know, what is right to do in every circumstance. And yet still you could be doing the opposite of the word, what the Word of God says. Because you've stopped evaluating yourself according to the Word of God. you just put yourself in a category of being right or being righteous. We need the Spirit of God to shine that light on our hearts every single day. Every conversation. Everything that we do. I need God to speak to me. I need God to, I need the Spirit of God to be alive in my life. In my, in my life. The Bible says don't quench the Spirit. How do you quench the Spirit? You quench the Spirit by silencing it and by not heeding it. Not listening to the voice of God. The Bible talks about the Holy Ghost being the paracletus. The one that comes alongside the help. The comforter. But if you only want Him to comfort you when you're sad. And not listen to His voice when you're mad. And not listen to His voice when you want to do something that your flesh wants to do. If God is just a situational God. Or a special events God then you're losing the power. You're not using that power that the Spirit of God wants to have in your life. He wants to be in everything. And he, he keeps telling us this. I've heard messages. I've heard things like this taught all my life. You know what? I need more of it. Because we're always being influenced. Satan is always trying to tear down whatever you believe. He's always trying to do it. So that's why Paul says... To Timothy, put good men in remembrance of these things. Because we we understand, it's like this verse, and I'm going to end with this. In Luke chapter 6, and verse 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. And so, there you have it. What's inside the heart of you? Everything's not bad. Everything's not good. And God is looking at the good and the bad on the inside of each one of us. And God's wanting to make a trade. He's wanting to take that something. He, he's always coming to us. Always negotiating with us. Always has to shine the light. Because sometimes we think we're doing it all right. And God has to shine the light. And this is where conviction's at. The Spirit of God will speak to you when you're hearing a message like this. The Spirit of God will, will shine the light on something in your life and begin to help you to see, no, I'm not pleased with that. I'm not here to beat you over the head, but I'm not pleased with that. 
My mercy endures forever. I'm not pleased with that. There's a chance for you to change. There's a chance for you to, to see the, your face in that mirror that is the Word of God and make the necessary changes. Praise God. We need to make the changes. We need to allow God, Spirit to speak to us. God, I want you to do those preparations in my heart. I, I don't want it to be my own opinion. I want you to do that. And then when my tongue gets engaged in conversation with anybody, I want it to be you speaking through me. I want you, Lord God, to talk to that person's life. I want you to give me the words to say that's going to make a difference in their eternity. God, I want to be able to sow a seed. I want to be able to water a seed that's already been. I want to see somebody's life flourish. I want to see somebody go down in the waters of baptism because... They've been led there. I've sowed a seed. I've watered a seed. But Lord, you were able to give the increase because somebody was busy in the field. I want to be busy in the field of souls working. But it starts with my heart. Every day, I've not arrived. There's things that God has to straighten out in me. But recognizing that and allowing God to speak to us. Allowing God to move in us. Allowing ourselves to be vulnerable enough to know that I have not arrived. I'm not this perfect Christian. I'm not this saint that does no wrong. But no, there's areas that God needs to work on. And sometimes the world sees those areas. Isn't that something? Sometimes people see those areas that you're deficient. And it can be a hindrance in your walk with God. It can be a hindrance in your witness for God. So it takes us being proactive. God, shine the light on me. If there's something in me that's not right, God, just maybe it's something I've done for 20 years, 30 years, maybe I've done all my life. But you're, you're beginning to show me. You're beginning to talk to me. Your spirit is moving. You see, the baptism washes away your sins, your past sins. That's what it covers, your past sins. But then the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, comes in to help perfect us. And it's a work. Some of us, like me, need a lot of work. And until eternity, God is working. Until I close my eyes for the last time, God's working. He's constantly working on all of us when we allow Him to. We just don't let everyone get to the place that we feel that we've arrived. We need no more work. Because now, the self-deception has become a reality. Entrenched, ingrained, and it takes quite some work to get it out. But I want to let God know that I recognize I'm still in flesh. I'm still human. I'm just dust. I make mistakes. And I'm so glad that your mercy endures forever. Oh, you have mercy that endures forever. You don't ever get to the place to say that I'm, I just had it. No matter how much you for, ask, sorry, ask forgiveness, I'm not going to forgive you. God doesn't reach that point. As long as your heart is bent towards God, doesn't matter how far you've gone, prodigal, when your heart is bent towards God and you make that move back to God, He's not going to refuse you. He says a broken and a contrite heart He would not refuse. Rather, quite the opposite, He draws nigh. The Bible says He's near to them that are of a broken heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to close this out and pray tonight in prayer. I'm not sure if there's any prayer requests that came through the, uh, through the internet. But we're going to talk to God. Father, I love you tonight. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. I thank you, Lord, for your touch, Lord. I thank you for your word that speaks to us, God, that shines that bright light, that spotlight on those hidden areas of our heart that helps us to see what you truly think. And what your word truly says, Lord. Not just what we've glossed over, Lord, in deception and told ourselves that we got it right. But God, I want to uncover those hidden treasures in your word that talk about what you think of me and what you want me to be and what you want me to do. God, I want to see that clearly, Lord. And I want to allow you, Lord, to work per that work of perfection in me, God. I need you. I want to be more like you. I need to be more like you. God, have your way. Touch and bless. I pray, Lord, for every need of healing, God, tonight, that you will show yourself mighty, Lord, God. 
Have your way, God. Work, Lord, miraculously, Lord. Do what only you can do, God. Nobody can move like you can. And God, I thank you tonight. Have your way. Touch us, strengthen us, bless us in all that we do. Go with us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening.